you might just uh, you might as well just forget everything you just heard because now we're going to go the complete opposite direction. Um, we're going to handcraft some WebAssembly. Uh, it's going to be really low level. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a little bit advanced maybe, but I'm going to step you all through it. So um, yeah, hold on to your brains because this is going to get wild. A um, little bit about me. My name is Emil Bay. Um, I, I am on Twitter and GitHub and wherever as Emil Bay's. And I live in Copenhagen in Denmark. So I was like thinking, should we do this in uh, Dansk? Should we go for Dansk? Yeah. Yes? Oh, OK. Uh, last night I was like, um, yeah, no, let's not do that. Um, I used to study math. Um, so that's why I have this affinity with like uh, low level stuff, I think. Um, uh, but I quickly dropped up dropped out to work on software instead. Um, now I am an independent consultant, uh, so I work mostly with uh, crypto and distributed systems and mathematics, but um, only in JavaScript. Uh, and when I say crypto, I mean cryptology, the mathematics, not the crypto coins. So I also want to uh, preface this uh, talk with, I, um, I come from like a um, front end background as well. Uh, and then kind of slowly transitioned into like more and more like deeper, um, I guess, technical stuff, like stuff that's not directly related to, to what you visually see. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind that when we look at the WebAssembly, uh, it might seem very far from the work you do daily if you're working with content management systems or you're working with front end code, but it is applicable. It's just some pretty special situations where WebAssembly is exactly what you need. Um, so I used to work with uh, data journalism and now I've kind of transitioned into more of the security and cryptography um, side of things. Okay, so what is WebAssembly? This is the official definition from the WebAssembly.org website. Uh, WebAssembly we often call WASM among friends. It's a binary instruction format um, so you can ship your programs as like very tiny programs because it's um, it's compiled down to like a binary bytecode, and it's um, it's based on a, a it's a stack-based virtual machine that your bytecode runs in. And um, whatever this means, uh, we don't care about that very much today. So um, let's just carry on. Um, one thing though is that since we like this definition is a bit hard to understand, especially if if you don't have a background in computer science. I don't. So like stack-based virtual machine, what does that what does that mean? Um, I don't know. So um, instead, maybe like let's think a little bit. Uh, it's called web assembly, so it must have something to do with web, and it must be pretty low level because it must be assembly, right? But it's not very web, and it's not very assembly when you look at it. It's not very web because you don't have access to anything that's web-like. There's no access to any browser APIs inside web assembly, and it's also not very assembly because you cannot interact directly with the machine. Normal machines are built around registers, but WebAssembly has no concept of a register. So it's, a, it's kind of like neither. Um, and I want to be even more negative because what is WebAssembly not? Um, well, WebAssembly has no syscalls. What I mean by this is that um, most people hear about WebAssembly and they hear that you can take your native programs and you can compile them into WebAssembly and suddenly you can run your native programs in a browser and that sounds great. So people think they can take their Bluetooth driver, compile it to WebAssembly and suddenly you can talk, suddenly you can talk Bluetooth from inside uh, your web browser. But you can't because you cannot talk to the operating system and that's called syscalls. Um, also, kind of on the same note, you don't get any new hardware access. So one thing that is often very exciting as a web developer is that is when uh, browser windows decide to expose some new hardware so we can do stuff that was completely impossible for us to before. Um, WebAssembly doesn't give us any of that. Um, actually, there's no magic. Just like uh, Stefan said yesterday, there's no magic. And also WebAssembly, there's no magic. That's just pure computation. So it depends on if you think that is exciting. I hope after this talk you'll think that is exciting. So what is WebAssembly? One thing I am extremely excited about, about with WebAssembly is I64s. 64-bit uh, integers is something that, um, especially I work with cryptography. Cryptography, we often work with numbers that are not just 32 bits or 64 bits. We work with numbers that are 256 bits or 512 bits or sometimes up to 4,000 bits long. And 64-bit integers give a very nice performance boost here. 
Also, with a lot of other stuff, we get a performance boost. I've done some informal micro benchmarks, and WebAssembly, you get like straight down to the machine, but um, the browser windows, and especially the V8 team, um, have optimized JavaScript so heavily that if I do micro benchmarks, so sit there and do some, some simple math, for example, then I only, I only get 20 to 30 percent performance boost by doing it in WebAssembly instead of doing it in JavaScript. So that means a lot of stuff in JavaScript is, is very fast, but with WebAssembly, the good thing about WebAssembly is that you get this surgical precision. With JavaScript, it can be very hard to predict what is this code going to compile down to. As we saw with uh, Sigurd's presentation yesterday, what is this code going to mean in the virtual machine, in the V8 virtual machine, or in the actual machine code? With WebAssembly, you know exactly what's going to happen, and it's also very predictable. You don't have to learn about the VM to understand what is this code going to translate into um, uh, in practice. And also, another thing I am very excited about, JavaScript is always um, put out there as the only language you can run on any device because it runs on a browser and runs on mobile phones and runs on a desktop. But I think WebAssembly is going to take over that because WebAssembly soon is going to be the truly run anywhere language. Just the other day, I saw a project on GitHub where you can run WebAssembly modules in what's called Ring Zero, so as kernel extensions. So that means you could write WebAssembly, load it into the kernel of your computer, and because of the security guarantees that WebAssembly give you, gives you, you know that WebAssembly is not going to go talk on your network or like become a rootkit or, um, or access devices like your keyboard to record what you're doing. WebAssembly is completely self-contained because of the sandbox, and I think that's extremely exciting. Also, Fastly, um, if you work with CDNs, Fastly have made it so that you can upload WebAssembly programs, and these programs are going to be deployed to all their pubs around the world, so their uh, points of presence. So that means you can suddenly um, run your programs all around the world at the same time um, without having to go all the way back to the data center. Um, okay, so that was a lot of um, hand wavy stuff. Uh, another thing I think is extremely exciting about WebAssembly is often when you see presentations about new stuff, um, it's kind of inspirational in the way that um, it's good to know about and you might be able to use it in a year or two. But WebAssembly, uh, you have been able to use that for the last year. So today you can see the. Um, now this was um, when I was home, so it took for Denmark, but it has 73. Global, present global coverage across, uh, across all the browsers, and it also runs in Node 8. So it means you can use it today, and I'm using it today. I have a lot of WordAssembly in production. So, um, so yeah, that's very exciting. Um, okay, there's also that quote I showed earlier. There's also a second part to it, because WebAssembly was actually not designed to be handwritten like we're going to do today. It was designed to be a compilation target, like a way to abstract away the actual physical machine, so you could take any code, compile it down to a portable format, and then run it anywhere. And this was kind of also what people uh, said about Java. That was their whole slogan, right? Compile, like, write once, run anywhere. And that's also what WebAssembly kind of does. But um, now, when I started out with WebAssembly, I, I'm a JavaScript developer. I don't know C or C++ or Rust, and um, why do I have to, to learn, like, I'm going to learn a new language anyway. Why should it be any of these, and why shouldn't I just not learn WebAssembly? So instead of uh, going up a level of abstraction, we're going to go down the ladder of abstraction, down into WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is a bytecode format. Bytecode means binary, means everything is going to be hexadecimal, and um, that's not very human brain friendly. So instead, there's this thing called the WebAssembly text format. It's actually meant as like a uh, debugging language, um, but uh, I didn't know that, so I just decided to write it on my own by hand. Uh, last week, I was at the Node.js Collaborator, su Collaborator Summit in, uh, in Berlin, and we talked, there were some browser vendors there, and we talked to the browser vendors, and especially we talked, I talked to um, Benedict Maurer from the V8 team, and I told him that I was writing WebAssembly in text format, and he was like, why, why would you do that to yourself? But um, it's not actually that bad. Um, also, it has a very nice acronym. It's called WHAT, so, and that's probably also what you s you're going to say when, when you see the first uh, bit of, bit of um, WebAssembly code. One thing I want to make clear, though, I said it was a debugging language, but I think it's very important to say that 
This bot format is a first class language, is officially supported by the WebAssembly working group, it's officially supported by all the browser vendors and the compilers. And, um, and if you, uh, for example, Firefox, if you have a, a website that's using a WebAssembly module and you open the dev tools in Firefox, it will decompile the WebAssembly module for you and write it in this text format. So that's also a reason to learn the text format so you can have introspection into your code and learn to debug it. Okay. A lot of talk, no code. So let's look at some code. This is our first WebAssembly module. Doesn't look so scary, huh? Uh, well, it is a bit foreign, so I'm going to walk you through it. Um, well, OK, first of all, what we're going to do here is like kind of the hello world of WebAssembly. We're just going to compute the square of a number. And I know it, it seems like extremely contrived, but we're actually going to build on top of this example. So it's important to get the basics down. First thing you notice is that um, the syntax is very weird. It's called S expressions. Um, S expressions kind of had their origin in a language called Lisp. WebAssembly text format. What is not a Lisp? It's not a Lisp. I want to make that very clear. What it is, though, is it's abstract. It is it is an abstract syntax tree, and abstract syntax trees are very nice to express in S expressions. So that's why they went with this format. Um, once you get used to it, you actually will grow to like S expressions a lot. I love coding in S expressions now. Um, the format is that you have the function you want to call as the first, first atom, it's called, in the S expression, and then you have your arguments on from there. Um, and when you read, when you read WebAssembly code, you start from the, all the way from the end, and you read outwards. Um, we're going to walk through how to read WebAssembly in just a bit. So that was the S expressions. Next thing you notice is just like with uh, JavaScript, ECMAScript modules, you need to define a module. And that's where you contain all your code. So um, yeah, basically, that's just a bit of boilerplate in this case. Um, next thing is that we have these um, dollar sign things, which are called labels. They're not variables. They're labels. They are human readable symbol names that we can use to, uh, to make the code a little bit more readable. Um, but once you compile your code, these are going to be replaced with numbers as to compress the whole uh, program into the binary format. Then we have types. Everything is extremely strictly typed. It's part of the security module model. This way, when um, your browser downloads a WebAssembly module, it can verify that the WebAssembly module is well behaved and it's not going to do anything you don't want. And also that the module has no undefined behavior. If you've done a bit of uh, native programming or like in C or C++, you know that it's filled with undefined behavior everywhere, and you have to be uh, very cautious what you do to not trigger any of this undefined behavior. That was a very big design goal of, um, of, of WebAssembly, not to have any undefined behavior. It has some non-determinism, if that means anything to you, but it's in very special cases, and uh, I think it's about half a page on the WebAssembly website where you can read in what cases is it going to behave non-deterministically. Uh, but I don't really understand when it's going to behave non-deterministically yet. So we have the types. Here we are working with 32-bit integers. These are also the integers we have in JavaScript. JavaScript numbers are double floats, they're called, but you can also compress them down to 32-bit integers. For example, if you're using the bitwise operators, then this happens behind the scenes for you. So you can see we have the parameters i32, the result is i32, and the next thing that's i32 here is not actually a type as such, this is an operator. And the operators have this convention that the first part of the operator is the return type. And then after that, we have whatever we want to do. So here in this case, we have a mall. Uh, I know we just heard that we, are not, we shouldn't name our, things, uh, our functions like this, but that's just how it happens when you go to the, to the lower level that everyone wants short acronyms. So here we are multiplying our two numbers. Next thing you notice is that, um, as I said before, this dollar sign $x is not a variable. It's a label. So every time you want to access some data, you have to be very explicit and say, I want to access this piece of data, which has an index. And, but when we write the text format, we can use a label to make it a bit more readable. Um, access is, is also something that you want to optimize if you have hot code. And I think most of the time that people use WebAssembly, um, at least that's when I use WebAssembly, it's because I have some code I want to hand optimize and make very fast. So being aware of all these situations, like what, what does this translate to in machine code, what ha actually happens behind the scenes, is, is, um, is very important. And so also, like, um, I was so happy working in WebAssembly that 
like it kind of takes away this whole wheel of abstraction where you don't really know what's going on, but with WebAssembly you know exactly what's going on. So how do we actually run this WebAssembly code? Um, you need a compiler, and you can go and, and download the compiler from, from GitHub at the WAPT uh, repository, but that's hard to remember and it's hard to do and uh, everything. So instead, uh, my friend Matthias put it on NPM, so you can just go on your computer now, NPM install WebAssembly binary toolkit, and that's going to um, download the latest version of the compiler, run the compilation for you, uh, put it in your path, and then you're good to go. So um, I've done this, and uh, I'll just show you um, what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to do this. Yes, worked. Okay. So um, let's go like this. You can see over here on the on the left side we have the uh, square function. On the right side I have my terminal. Oh, I want to go to the right place. So you can see we have the uh, square dot uh, what file here. I'm just going to clean up. Oh. Yes, okay, that cleaned everything. So to compile the, um, compile the what file, there's um, this little binary tool called uh, what to wasm, which takes in a, a, um, the text format file and produces the binary. Uh, so let's just do that real quickly. And now you can see we have a square.wasm file here. And uh, if we look at that, it's a binary file, but we can still try and have a look what's inside the, uh, the wasm. Just going to see if I can get this to look right. Okay, so you can see the program is only a couple of bytes. It's actually not very long. Let's see how many bytes is this? 44 bytes. You can see kind of some of the internal structure of the, the binary format. Like it has the ASM header to, um, to, to signal that this is a WebAssembly module. You can also see some of the symbols in there, like we call the function square. It cannot compress the square away because otherwise we don't have that from the JavaScript side when you want to call it. So you can also see that in there. And otherwise, if you are very well versed in WebAssembly, you can also see the opcode. So you can see where it's multiplying. You can see where it's accessing the x. So the x is called zero, if you can see the, the zero up there. No? OK. Um, yeah. You'll learn. It comes, it comes with practice. OK. Let's get back in here. No. Cool. OK, so when you need to access things from, uh, from JavaScript, there's this whole little dance that you need to do. Um, here you can see that we are reading in that WebAssembly module, we are instantiating a new module, or we, like, we are creating a new WebAssembly.module. Then we need to instantiate it with the imports, and like, there's all this stuff going on. I think this is uh, extremely complicated. I also have a, a weird definition of what's complicated, but um, I, like, so this is not going to go. Um, instead, there's also this other tool on NPM. You can install NPM, uh, install what to JS, which will take the what uh, text format, compile it for you, compress it down, and bundle it up in a single JavaScript file. So that way, you don't need to make sure that the WASM binary file is in the correct location on your server and all that. It's all self-contained. And um, so this works, with, this works with Browserify and, and uh, Rollup and all these other modules, and I think actually Webpack has their own loader, so you don't need to use something like this. You can just uh, directly include the um, square.wasm file, and you'll figure out how to load it and bundle it and make it self-contained. Um, yeah, so you call this. It's very easy. Um, just like before, call the web what file, and then uh, we can choose where to output it, so output it to a square.js file, and uh, we're just going to try and do that. Um, do like this again. OK, so I have the, we can just remove the square dot uh, wasm. Wasm file, we don't need that anymore because we now we're going to make a self-contained uh, module. So we do the what to JS, taking now, uh, what is the square dot what? And we output the square.js. Cool. And now we can see we have a square.js file. I can just quickly show you what it looks like, but it's not very important um, 
what it looks like um, on the inside. Um, it has some, uh, some things, like some extra uh, bells and whistles in here, like it can tell you whether WebAssembly is actually supported in the runtime you're working within. You can see our WebAssembly module here is uh, encoded in, in base 64, so it can be shipped inside a something that's not binary. Then it has some stuff for helping you manage memory, uh, because memory is manually managed in WebAssembly, which I'm going to show in a moment. And down here you can see that little instantiate um, dance that I had before is all handled for you. So, um, but this is like, you can just forget about this. I, I never look at this anyway. Um, cool. So, um, we can also run this. Just include the bundle. Uh, it's going to put uh, out an object called export where you can dot in and get the square function. And, um, it returns four, just like you'd expect. So that was the, um, our first uh, WebAssembly module, uh, a square function. I'm just, because we have some extra time here, I'm just going to quickly show you how to evaluate, evaluate WebAssembly in your head. Because when you're programming, you sit all there all the time and you are evaluating the code in your head yourself, right? Because um, you want to predict what's going what's gonna to happen. So I have extended the, um, the WebAssembly module just a little bit. I, in WebAssembly, you can also have them completely self-contained um, in the way that you can define a start function. So when the module is included, this function is run for you and you get to do some stuff before JavaScript takes over. Or I think this is also going to be very useful if you embed WebAssembly in a context that is not JavaScript. Uh, so here I just made a main function like you do in, in C and C++. And uh, I call the square function and you can see if you want to put in a number in WebAssembly, you also have to define it very specifically as a constant, which is another function call or another instruction. So we call the, the square. Um, and um, next thing also, just a little note, uh, all the parentheses here are clustered together and it, it looks like it's very really hard to manage and all that, but there's this... Um, uh, editor plugin that is out there for like almost all editors called parinfer comes from the Lisp community and instead of uh, instead of managing all the brackets yourself, uh, you manage them with indentation like you know from Python and it also forces you to kind of make readable code in WebAssembly. So let's try and evaluate the function. Um, in when you're evaluating S expressions, you are just substituting and um, so in this case, we can say that we know the, the constant 2 is loaded into the position that x um, signals. So we can just substitute that for the, for the in here in the local axis. Then we can substitute the multiplication to 4. Then we can substitute the, the 4 out of here. You notice I have this drop thing. Um, this whole thing about being a stack-based VM kind of surfaces sometimes you cannot just return things out into the void. You have to tell the WebAssembly VM that, okay, this value you just got back, it's not a bug. It's actually because I meant for you to just throw it away. And you can also see we can have no up. So like this now is all way evaluated into a no up. Now because we're dropping it, it's also going to become a no up. So nothing happens. Okay. So that was how to evaluate WebAssembly. Now we have uh, our first WebAssembly module all done. But um, let's have a look at some uh, real WebAssembly. So what we're going to look at next is some WebAssembly I wrote for uh, some machine learning. You can also use this WebAssembly in like a physics engine or if you're doing um, like the, um, the edge detection that uh, Martin showed yesterday, the workhorse of those things are always how to compute the distance between points. So you can see it's going to be a little bit more advanced. Um, I'm going to walk through the function slowly, but first I just want to give the you the intuition for why, uh, why, is the, why is the code written this way. So we have two points. You want to figure out how far is it between the two points. Um, we're going to go back to grade school. Uh, this is my duty as a wannabe mathematician. I have to teach you some math here as well. So you can draw a little triangle and you can put it into a coordinate system and uh, then there's this thing called the uh, Pythagoras theorem. You know, A squared plus B squared is equals C squared. We can rearrange a little bit and now we get C, which is the green line. The distance is calculated by doing the square root of the squares. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. Um, when we have points, these A's and B's are just the difference between 
the individual components, so difference, distance, not that much of a difference in the words. OK, so this was the function. Uh, first thing I want to point out is that when I write what, I try to follow the same convention that you have the return type as the first part of the name and then the operation that you're going to do after the dot. You can also see that I used a new type here, the F64. F64 is exactly like a JavaScript number. Oh, in WebAssembly, we just call it a, a float 64 because it fills out 64 bits. You can also see if you want to do variables, you have to define them as locals. Um, again, like the get local. But in WebAssembly, you cannot just define variables ad hoc. You have to define all the variables you're going to use up front. In practice, this is not that much of a problem, but um, it just means that you need to know. You can also see that now we are using a new uh, square root function um, on the, with a F64, and we know it returns a F64, and that matches up the, uh, with the result that we told um, WebAssembly we were going to use. And now we call out to the square function we had before um, and put in the, um, the two locals that we had here. But if we try to compile this, we get a type mismatch because our square function from way back um, returned a I32, and I32s are not F64s, so you need to tell WebAssembly that you know what you're doing, you're going to convert these things. This is also one of the things that can be surprising in JavaScript, or people always, when they are trying to be negative about JavaScript, they're like, oh, everything is converted, and you can plus strings with numbers and all this stuff. Not in WebAssembly. You have to tell WebAssembly that you know what you're doing, and you're going to convert this. Um, in this case, we say, OK, convert our 32-bit integer to a 64-bit float, and we know the integer is not negative. We know it's, so we say it's unsigned. In, in WebAssembly, there's no difference between, uh, or there's only a data type for integer. There's no data type for signed and unsigned integer, which is something that you often have in, a, in like C or C++. Um, but WebAssembly doesn't really care. It only cares when you do the actual operations. So in the places where it's important whether things uh, can be negative, you have to use special instructions, like here. So that was the complete function. Um, if you run this, you can see that one thing I also want to clear up is that uh, when you dot things, it's not like you can make objects or namespaces from within WebAssembly. It just means that that becomes part of the symbol, so we have used the bracket syntax to, to actually get to the function. And, um, and uh, yeah, that just works. So um, I said in the abstract we're going to have fun. Are you having fun yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know this is a very special kind of fun, so, um, so yeah. <laughs> But um, we're going to take it up another notch. Now we're going to get um, into some code that's, I actually think I have this code in production. Um, the, uh, the distance between points is kind of like one of those general algorithms or methods that you use all over the place, so you can just like copy and paste it between places. But now we have an actual algorithm that's, um, that's also going to take us into some pretty advanced stuff with WebAssembly. Um, so, we are going to compute the distance between vectors. Um, this is also my inner mathematician coming out again. Vectors, we just call them arrays because um, that's what they are. So what we want to do here is that we want to take um, two arrays. It could be two images. Images can be represented as very long um, bit arrays. And we want to figure out what is the difference between them. Why would you want to figure out that? Well, maybe it's a part of a machine learning algorithm, or maybe you're doing some visual testing where you want to figure out are the, dim are the images different, or you might just subtract them from each other and paint the difference, for example, with red pixels, like we saw yesterday. Um, and this can be done very efficiently in, uh, in WebAssembly. Um, it, it would be probably more advantageous to do this in something like WebGL. But uh, this is a WebAssembly talk, right? It's not WebGL. So, um, so let's just look at some of the, the new things we have to learn here, because there's a lot of code. Um, first thing we see is that we have this new thing called memory. Until now, we have only been able to work with very simple primitives. We have only, in WebAssembly, there's only four types, so it's, uh, it's pretty easy to learn the system. You have I32, uh, you have I64, you have F32 and you have F64. And that's it. So you have to build your programs from that. But
But if you want to take in more advanced data structures like arrays or like objects or anything like that, you have to serialize it and put it into linear memory. And um, then you also have to figure out how to read it out of linear memory. So you have this little contract or little dance you need to do with WebAssembly. So linear memory. Linear memory is just a bunch of bytes. Um, here I've tried to draw up what, what things look like in linear memory. Um, linear memory bytes, you know them from um, you know them from CSS calls and stuff. Bytes can be numbers between zero and two hundred fifty five, and uh, they take up eight bits, and that's um, and um, you can represent them at, like with indexes inside the, the like a big byte array, and that's what memory is. Memory is just a very big array that you can point into. Now, if you want to do more advanced stuff like I32s, which are the integers we've been going with so far, they take up four bytes. So suddenly, if you want to read them out, you have to skip by four every time, and then you have the very big uh, uh, numbers which take up eight bytes. So to put images into linear memory, um, we have to figure out how to tell a function where to read from. And in other native languages, you call this a pointer. So normally, I just say data that pointer, and then there's two ways to tell WebAssembly how long is the data you're going to read. You could either say, okay, the data starts at, at this index and it ends at some other index, or you could say the data starts at this index and it's going to go on for so long. The two methods are analogous, but WebAssembly, with some of the new stuff coming out, is settling on the convention that you pass in a pointer to the start and you pass in a number for how long the data structure you're working with is. So in our case, if we are passing in two images as um, as bit arrays, uh, as byte arrays, then we need a pointer for the first array, and we need a pointer for the second array, and then we need a length, so the WebAssembly knows for how long to read. Um, the uh, careful listener might also notice that these pointers are I32s, so they're 32 bits. Um, when I got my first computer, I was it was like the first uh, time that you could get Windows 64 bit. Uh, so that meant you could have more than four, four gigabytes of RAM. Um, that's exactly what's going on here. In WebAssembly, you can only have four gigabytes of RAM. That's all you can address into. So that's um, probably important if you want to build Photoshop, which can, which can quickly eat up a lot of memory, or if you want to compile Chrome into WebAssembly, that's also not going to fly. So, um, so you only have 32-bit integers. You only have four gigabytes of memory to work with. I just want to quickly show what it looks like if we need to write things into WebAssembly memory. Um, so the first thing is memory. I just want to show memory um, is allocated in pages in WebAssembly. You cannot say I want a, I want another eight bytes. You say I want 64 kilobytes at a time, and that's what the one is doing up here when we export the memory. It's saying I want to start out with one page of WebAssembly memory, and then you can go on from there and get new pages. So when we want to write in our two images, we have to make sure that there's enough memory available. So the first thing we do is we tell WebAssembly, make sure that you have enough pages of memory available for me. And these pages, they need to be long enough that we can contain the byte lengths of both images. Then we also need to calculate these pointers. And the pointers, it, pointer is a very fancy word, but all it means is index. It's just an index into this array. So we commit, uh, we make a variable for the image A pointer, and we start at zero. Then we write in the image A uh, at the offset zero, so we write it at one end. Then we increment the offset to the end of the image. That's going to be the start of the next image, and um, and so we have to write that there. And um, then we pass on in these numbers. So these numbers are now back to I32s. So they're very simple, so we can give them directly to WebAssembly. And then the WebAssembly can go back to the linear memory and read out from where we told it to. Uh, one way you might be able to get um, image data, and Martin also showed, had this on his presentation yesterday, but I'm just going to repeat it here. You might have it from a canvas element, where you can read out image data as U and A array. This is a special UNT array, but this is actually byte data that you can read directly into WebAssembly memory. And uh, also another little note, these, uh, these pixels are represented as I32s um, because they're represented with the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, and then the alpha channel. Um, so when you have to read out the pixels again from WebAssembly, you're going to read them out as unsigned bytes. This U 
is the same U as the U and 8. So if you're reading them out as unsigned bytes, you have to read them one pixel at a time. And because we're working with this index, and the index in a, is in a, it's not local to some image, it's global to the linear memory, so we have to do this pointer arithmetic where we say, okay, we know one image starts at the W pointer, and then as we increment and iterate over the arrays, we have to add them together all the time. So that's a bit different than we do in, in, uh, in JavaScript. And uh, I made the little comment up here. The comments are very handy because it's kind of dense code that will take you a little while to pass when you're reading WebAssembly. Um, so you can see like, the, the code up there is kind of JavaScripting. That's what we're doing. Now the next thing, when we want to loop over things, we also have to learn how to loop, like you do when you, you start with a new language. And in, uh, in WebAssembly, that's also a bit different because that's how it works uh, in a machine. You have this thing called a um, program counter. And every time you go to a new instruction, the counter increments. But in, uh, for example, in C, you have these things called go-tos. Go-tos just mean that you can take the program counter and you can rewind it so you can go to any place in the program. We also have these, uh, they're called branching instructions. We actually have that in JavaScript as well. You know break and continue from, uh, from loops. You can do the same thing in, uh, in WebAssembly so we can make this loop construct. Um, we can give it a label. So that means we can jump to that place in the program. Um, and then when we're looping over things, we have this branch if. So the branch if is going to go back to this label if the next condition is true. And all we're doing here is just saying we're going to increment the offset by one, one because we're reading one byte at a time. And then we're going to see are we at the end yet. If we're not at the end yet, we're going to loop back or branch back to continue and repeat our loop. So this is just, you just get used to this. Um, there's a couple of other of these like uh, branching instructions that you can use, um, but they're for more, more advanced purposes. You can also see that we had to define our counter. So you might call this i in a normal for loop called offset here. You have to define that at the beginning of the function. So this was what the final program look, uh, looks like. It's, um, it can be a bit intimidating. Everything can be a bit intimidating in WebAssembly, but it's just about getting into that mode of evaluating things from the inside out and, um, and also some, some good comments in there. Um, how are we going for time? Good? Um, OK, so I just want to reiterate, this is not just fun. I mean, it's fun, right? But it's not just for fun. Um, this is very production ready. I am using this today. Um, I have this project uh, with, a f with a friend called Sodium Friends. Um, friend is Matthias, Matthias Boos. He's been here and, and spoken before, and you might be know him from the Node community and use his modules. We have this project called Sodium Friends. Sodium, LibSodium, is a cryptographic library. It's kind of in contrast to OpenSSL, which is often what you use in, when you're doing HTTPS or, or whatever. Um, LibSodium is like a modern set of cryptographic primitives, and it's very easy to use, and there's something called misuse resistant. So that means that even if you screw up a little bit, it's not going to break your whole security while with something like Open SSL and the primitive they have, if you screw up a little bit, then you might just wreck the, uh, the security of your whole system. So we really like this cryptographic library. It's available as a C module, so we have C bindings for Node, but what if you want to do your cryptography in the browser? Well, then you're just in luck, because we made it so that you can run it in the browser. We hand wrote a lot of the primitives in WebAssembly. That's why we started out with WebAssembly, uh, and I want to just put a big line under hand wrote we wrote these primitives. It doesn't take very long, actually, to get into the flow of WebAssembly and convert algorithms into WebAssembly. I think we spend probably a day with, with each of the algorithms, so it can, it can go very fast. Um, you can use this today. You can just go npm install Sodium Universal, and um, that is going to run in browser and in Node, and, um, and hopefully soon also uh, inside the Linux kernel. Um, so um, that was kind of the actually that was actually kind of the content I had, but I have something else I want to show you, because uh, so this is going to be like a, a little sneak peek of something I've been working on. Um, I said earlier, well, this is uh, one of the crypto functions. This is a function called uh, this is a, a piece from a function called xchacha. 
symmetric cryptography function you can use to encrypt files or communication over the network. Um, you can see it's very dense code. There's a lot of repetition, but it's impossible to see if I have a bug, like why this does the seven down here. That seven is very, very easy to overlook. But as I said earlier, the WebSemi text format is just the abstract, abstract syntax tree. As, and as we saw yesterday, if you can pass these abstract syntax trees, then you can also manipulate them. Um, writing a parser for WebAssembly is pretty easy. I have no experience with compilers or parsers or anything. So I just sat down and looked what are the algorithms that you normally use. I uh, looked up on Wikipedia. There was something called recursive descent. Wrote a parser for that. Took me about a day to kind of get right. Um, I haven't published the code because it's very ugly and I don't know if it's full of bugs. Um, but when you have a parser, then you can just invent your own programming language. So I invented a macro language for WebAssembly so that we can take the very dense code that we had before, turn it back into these are the actual definition, like mathematical definition of this H cha cha function, and suddenly everything becomes somewhat more readable. Now, this is very readable to me because I'm used to this crypto function and I know exactly where things are going to go. But this way, suddenly, the code is much more manageable and you can do your own small uh, domain specific languages for whatever you are, are doing in WebAssembly. Um, I also tried, uh, no, I'm not going to show it, I tried to implement the Sobel operator that Martin showed yesterday because I wanted to see what the performance was going to be in WebAssembly. And when you're doing stuff like that, you can also just invent your own language features ad hoc. It's very easy to just add it into the, uh, the AST parser. Um, so I think that's pretty much what I had. I just want to say, Thank you. You can find me on GitHub and, uh, and Twitter as Emil Base. And you can also, if you want to nerd out about WebAssembly or crypto, I'm not on Slack, but I'm on RSC. And you can find me in the Sodium Friends channel on uh, Freenode. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. I'm a WebAssembly developer now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we have some questions. OK. Are you ready? Cool. Yeah. OK. <laughs> what is the big deal about 64-bit integers? Yeah, OK. Um, I'll just go back <laughs> okay. to the slide. See no, you. I haven't made a slide, but I'll just go back to the memory slide. Because um, so when you, when you um, work with these very large numbers, like now in, in WebAssembly, we only have the i64. When I'm working with crypto, we're working with i256. And we cannot represent that. So we have instead to go in and do something called LIMPs where you say, OK, 256-bit number, we can just split it up into small i64-bit numbers. And then every time something overflows, like you need to go from one number to like one piece to the next, you need to do some manual um, code there. And that's where things get slow. But if you can work with i64s instead of i32s, then suddenly you can operate on twice the data, and it should be twice as fast. Um, so for example, with uh, Sodium Universal, we have a hash function called Blake2b. Blake2b needs 64-bit integers, but in JavaScript, the JavaScript implementation we have, we had to use 32-bit integers, because that's what you have in JavaScript, and it's extremely slow. Then put it into WebAssembly, and suddenly we are only like within a magnitude of what the C performance is. So WebAssembly is suddenly extre like, is extremely attractive for that, those kind of cases. OK, related to that. I think, is what are the primary end user benefits for developers in learning? In learning WebAssembly? Web yeah. Well, for me, the whole benefit of learning WebAssembly was suddenly understanding what actually goes on inside the computer, like with the instructions that I know WebAssembly is still an abstraction on what the computer is doing. For example, with a real computer, real computer is based around registers, and you have to load things in and out of these registers. While WebAssembly, you have the locals, which are kind of like your virtual registers uh, or your variables that can only contain like very specific widths of data. Um, so for me, the whole thing was like, OK, what actually, how do you write a program when you cannot use objects and dot into things? Like, you need to organize the memory. And I've also spent a lot of time figuring out, like, there's this thing in when you write C programs with a, there's a stack and a heap, depending on where you put your data and all this stuff. I didn't understand any of that before. While now, right now, I'm working on my own memory allocator because I, like, I kind of understand it now. Because you're starting from the bottom. <laughs> like, instead of going up the ladder of abstraction, you're going down the ladder of abstraction. And, and suddenly, you have to kind of reinvent the wheel. But you get a much, like, much more uh, grounded understanding yeah. of what's actually going on. 
Is it addictive? <laughs> it, uh, sounds it sounds a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I sounding junior? Or? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, then the last question is: What have you written that was the most fun or the most useful thing you're most proud of? Mm, I wrote. I've been working on. There's this uh, machine learning algorithm called K-means, and it's if you take a course in machine learning, which is like the hot topic right now, it, artificial intelligence. K-means is like a statistical technique where you can say, okay, I have this data and I want to find groups in the data. Uh, that sounds very abstract. So what I was working on is, you know, when you go to Dribble, the design website, between all the images, they always have like a, a small widget where it says, okay, these are the five primary colors in this image, and you can click it and you can see other images that have the same colors. So I wanted to do that. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is with K-means. So you say, okay, I have this image. Uh, it image is just pixels, and pixels are just uh, three-dimensional data points, three dimensions for the three colors. Then you can just say, okay, I have these pixels, I'm going to represent them in 3D space, and uh, then I'm going to look for five groups because I want five colors. And then suddenly you can do stuff like that yourself, and it's uh, pretty easy to do in WebAssembly because you're working with these byte arrays anyway, and uh, you can do it extremely fast. So this kind of, this, uh, for like small images, this almost runs at like native speed. Um, or like, I mean, real time. Not, uh, yeah. It's a data speed, but it runs kind of real time. Yeah. And I think that's like those kind of things are a lot of fun to write. Uh, but it's just fun to geek out about this. It's kind of like puzzling the whole thing about like how do you organize this memory? And then, okay, there's no one to tell you how to do it, and there's no magic, and there's no help. Like, I mean, of course there's help, but I mean, um, it's not like you're gonna sit there and think, okay, I just need to f to to find the right API or something. It's because I don't know the API. No. You have to invent the API. You have right. to figure out how am I gonna how am I gonna do this. So kind of I guess WebAssembly kind of appeals to people who are like into puzzling and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, cool. Emil. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>